Hi, welcome back to Colonial Encounters in Asia and Africa. Uh, previously, we learned about that second wave of European conquests uh, during this period uh, that was distinct from other colonial European colonial conquests. And now we're going to learn about being under European rule. Okay, European takeover was often traumatic for the colonized peoples. The loss of life and property could be devastating. And cooperation and rebellion. Uh, some groups and individuals cooperated willingly with their new masters. Employment in the armed forces, um, even the elite often kept much of their status and privileges. So we're looking at soldiers, administrators, and local rulers. With Relatively few Europeans in the trop tropical colonies, the empires had to rely on various groups of collaborators. Soldiers, often recruited from groups deemed to be um, martial races, were essential for conquest, pacification, and putting down revolts. Uh, the colonial bureaucracy increasingly used native clerks in its lower administration. Uh, various local rulers from Indian Raj, uh, Rajas to African chiefs served as a key source of exercising indirect power over colonial societies. Each of these collaborating groups expected some form of reward for their service and loyalty to the conquerors. Um, governments and missionaries promoted European education as well. The growth of uh, small class with Western education. Governments relied on them increasingly over time. So this is a small Western educated elite. Um, an essential, essential but often frustrated segment of society was a small percentage who attained a Western education. While they were much needed to run the colony, the colonizers often, often viewed them with suspicion and disdain, and the colonized might view them as having thrown their light in with the conquerors. So it kind of put them between... A rock and a hard place. And there were periodic rebellions. For example, the Indian Rebellion, uh, rebellion from 1857 to 1858 based on a series of grievances. And the Indian Rebellion began as a mutiny among Indian troops. Rebel leaders advocated revival of the Mughal Empire. Um, and it widened India's racial divide. The British were less tolerant of the natives. And that led the British government to assume direct control over India. Colonial rule was characterized by numerous revolts, both small and large. And one of the most important was the Indian Rebellion of 1857. Were large numbers of Sepoys, those are Indian troops, fighting for the Raj, uh, and they mutinied. Well, the spark that set off the con uh, conflagration was the use of bullets greased with cow and pig fat, and that was offensive to both Hindus and Muslims. There were a wide variety of grievances that motivated the rebels to staged this revolt, which was brut brutally crushed within a year, but bitter memories remained in the British hardened racial boundaries between the colonizer and the colonized. Okay. Colonial empires with a difference. In the new colonial empires, uh, race was a prominent point distinguishing rulers from the ruled. Education for colonial subjects was limited and emphasized practical matters suit suitable for at the primitive minds. And even the best educated natives rarely made it to the upper ranks of the civil service. So we see a sharp divide with those racial boundaries. And racism was especially pronounced in areas with a large number of European settlers, like, for example, uh, South Africa. And the colonial states imposed deep changes in people's daily lives. Colonizers were fascinated with counting and classifying their new subjects. In India, um, they appropriated an idealized caste system. And in Africa, they identified or invented distinct tribes. So unlike earlier forms of colonialism, the 19th and 20th century used scientific racism to justify the firm racial barriers between the colonizer and the colonized. There were substantially fewer interracial unions in this era than in the Iberian colonial world of the 1500s. In settler colonialism in South Africa um, and other settler colonies, 
where there were large populations of white settlers with more elaborate systems of racial exclusion uh, were developed to inst institutionalize racial separation and white access to cheap native labor in mines and farms. And in South Africa, this eventually evolved into the system known as apartheid. And as I said, this played a great impact on their daily lives. Unlike previous forms of colonialism, there was much more profound impact on the daily life of the colonized subjects. More efficient means of tax collecting, uh, transportation and communication, as well as more invasive changes to land owning, economic systems, administration, and public health. That meant that the foreign presence was felt much stronger than in the earlier forms of empire. And gender roles also played an important part. Uh, the colonizers took pride in active masculinity, and they defined the colonized as being soft and passive and almost feminine. And the link to gender ideology and race prejudice also supported colonial rule. And European women were seen as emblems of civilization. And some colonized peoples, uh, like the Sikhs and the Gurkhas, the Kamba and the Hausa, were gendered as masculine or martial races uh, because of their um, skills and were recru recruited into security forces. So this is where we see a traditional India and tribal African. In the effort to understand and control their colonized peoples, the colonial empires developed systems and sciences such as anthropology to study, organize and control colonial societies. And this process served to create an idealized version of the society in question to condemn other variations. In India, the result was the British creation and support for an understanding of India as a classical and unchanging society structured by Brahmanism and the caste system, and forms of modernity were scorned as inauthentic. In Africa, the colonial system looked for and supported chiefs as the ideal tribal rulers, and this condescending strategy allowed them to look down upon much of Africa as barbaric and politically simple and to pursue divide and rule tactics, which pitted tribe against tribe. And the gendering of the empires was an area that saw great importance placed upon gender. White uh, men were to be virile and hyper-masculine, while colonized men were typically effeminized, unless it fit into a, a useful category of a martial race, like the Sikhs, Gurkhas, Kamba, and Hausa that I mentioned earlier. And white women were placed on an elite pedestal and had to be protected from the assumed uh, sexual threat of native men. But here we see um, some political contradictions um, and hypocrisies. As all the European powers, uh, but especially France and Britain, were becoming increasingly democratic at home, they ruled the colonies as if they were dictators. And these were dictatorships. The colonizers were also loath to modernize and thus potentially destabilize the societies they govern. Hence, they preferred what they understand as tribal, traditional, and rural communities. The result was a sharp contrast between governmental practice and ideology at home and in the colonies. And the colonial policies were very contradicting to the European core values and practices. Like I said, there were essentially dictatorships, and the colonies were the antithesis of national independence, the racial classifications were against Christian and Enlightenment ideas of human equality, and many colonizers were against spreading modernization to those colonies for the fear of advancement and progress. And in time, the visible contradictions in European behavior helped undermine the foundations of colonial rule. And that's our wrap-up of colonial empires with the difference under European rule. I'll see you guys again for ways of working comparing those colonial uh, economies.